Now, your work has brought a lot of attention to this alternative hypothesis over the past decade, and there have been a number of people who have tried to test it. Um, how would you reconcile the findings that have have not demonstrated um, what one would be what 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 would be predicted by the carbohydrate insulin model? Well. <sighs> And this then gets into the kind of questions we talked about earlier about judging the value of the experiments, how rigorously they're done, and uh, the biases and preconceptions of the researchers. So, and again, I've been having these arguments on Twitter this week, and I have to stay the hell off Twitter. Um, waste of time. You know, and you know this, we funded these people at NUSI. We funded two groups of researchers, one uh, who was inherently basically had a hypothesis uh, that dietary fat and fat balance was a driver of obesity, and we had one that had a carbohydrate insulin model like we did. And uh, the researchers who believed the conventional wisdom uh, interpreted their results uh, as supporting the conventional wisdom and refuting the carbohydrate insulin model and the researchers who supported the believe the carbohydrate insulin model interpreted their results as supporting that model. So, so let's pause there for a second because I simply don't see how this field can make any progress. And I'm trying to understand how this field can make progress in a way that physics does. When, as you point out, everybody in this field is biased. Everybody has a point of view. And everyone seems to do experiments that simply confirm their point of view. Um, it, it strikes me as a very difficult, and, and, and here's, there's one other thing that makes this more difficult, which is the inherent messiness of biology, right? Um, and I, it's messy for several reasons, right? It's messy because it's as, as complicated as physics is, I think biology is more complicated. We don't have a standard model of biology the way we have a standard model of physics. So there are more unknown unknowns in biology. And then secondly, the experiments are far more difficult to control. I think there's more noise in the biologic experiments. And then you couple that with everything we just said, I just don't understand what a path forward looks like towards a reconciliation. Well, yeah, I don't know if reconciliation is the word you're looking for. You want to know which hypothesis is right. And we're now in effect recapitulating. Yeah, I mean a scientific reconciliation. Discussions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're recapitulating the discussions we had, whatever, eight, ten years ago now, when Nusi was starting. Um, the first thing you have to do, so I was thinking about this because, you know, one of my favorite stories is back around 2009, after Good Calories, Bad Calories came out, I was invited to lecture at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center, which is the largest obesity research center in the country. Uh, academic. And I gave my uh, this lecture, Why We Get Fat, uh, Adiposity 101, and I suggested that the energy balance hypothesis thinking was, I like to say, not even wrong, stealing from Wolfgang Pauli, and then why all the reasons why it should be replaced with this hormonal regulatory disorder focusing on um, uh, insulin. And after my talk, one of the faculty raised his hand very politely, a gentleman who was probably then as old as I am now, maybe 65, and he said, excuse me, Mr. Taubes, would it be correct to assume that you think we are all idiots? <laughs> because the argument I was making is that they embrace the wrong paradigm. And it was a tough question because partially the answer, I want to say, well, that's one way to look at it. Um, I can't say that. So what I said to them is I think the problem here is that when you entered the field, there was a paradigm, a way of thinking about obesity that seemed intu so intuitively obvious, this idea that it's an energy balance disorder, that you never questioned it. And certainly your, you know, your mentors didn't question it. And so you were assumed this had been well tested and well proven and, you know, uh, unambiguous and that it deserved to be dogma and it hadn't been and it didn't. And that's been a problem ever since. Um, now we come along 50 years later, 40 years later, and we have to get people to a huge proportion of the community to entertain the possibility that their fundamental belief system is wrong. So this isn't a subtle shift in thinking. This is you're operating under the wrong paradigm. You think the Earth is flat and it's round, or you think the 
Earth rotates, the sun rotates around the Earth, but it's the other way around. Um, 99.9999, throw in as many nines as you want, percent of the time people say that they're quacks. So why are you not? Uh, that's a good question. I often argue this with my old friend, our old colleague, Mark Friedman, and Mark says, well, we're not because we're right. And I say, well, every quack thinks they're right, Mark. That's not evidence that we're not quacks. That's the same tautology that you argue against. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, the other argument is an even better one. I'm not a doctor, so technically I can't be a quack. The best I could uh, hope for is whack job. Um, I, I would offer a more compelling reason if you're if you turn out to not be a quack, which is the application of the current model is failing. Um, that's probably the most compelling reason to continue to question it, I would say, right? So in other words, if we if we believed that the Earth was the center of the universe and every time we tried to launch a rocket into space, it blew up because we failed to understand gravity and orbits, yeah. I would hope we would then say, God, what if the Earth is actually moving, even though it doesn't feel like it? This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.